So welcome everyone. I think I know everyone in the room. My name is Natalie Mark. I'm a partner here at Taylor English. And today we have a very interesting topic. Um, and this topic really addresses jury verdicts out of or in states that don't require unanimous jury verdict. Obviously, Georgia is a state where you have to have a unanimous jury verdict. But there are several states that do not require a unanimous jury verdict. And if you practice in other jurisdictions, then this topic is for you. If you represent clients who litigate in other jurisdictions, then this topic is for you. If you solely practice in federal court, then this topic may not be for you, but it still should be interesting nevertheless. Um, as you guys already know, I am a Georgia litigator. I've litigated in Georgia for a while, but uh, Henry and I had the opportunity to work on a case in Ohio. And we did a six week trial in Ohio and we represented about 33 plaintiffs and they were tenant and common owners. And what these plaintiffs did was they invested in, um, in this very complex uh, 1031 exchange, which is basically something that you do for tax benefits. If you sell real estate and you get significant profit from that real estate, and you don't necessarily want to pay taxes on that real estate, then you would invest in what's called a 1031 exchange in hopes of not having, of getting tax advantages for doing that. Um, our clients were pr primarily um, retirees who were looking for additional um, income in their later years so that they wouldn't have to work and they would have this dormant income that would just keep coming in. Um, they invested with um, a company and they thought that the investment was a good investment because for years they actually got paid on their investment, which is what everybody wants in an investment. Um, however, they soon learned that they were never supposed to invest in this particular company because the mortgage company um, told the company that was trying to invest with the tick owners, no, you don't want a bunch of tick owners. We only want one person on the mortgage. We don't want to have to chase down 30 plus people to collect on the mortgage. So the mortgage company actually told them that they couldn't invest and they did what was called a wraparound mortgage to hide the fact that they had sold this property to the tick owners. Um, and they were able to do this for years. And basically it wasn't until the market kind of went south that it was discovered and our tick owners were defrauded out of millions and millions of dollars. So we went to Ohio to litigate this. Um, the companies were based in Ohio and the transaction um, took place in Ohio, although our plaintiffs uh, lived out of state and they didn't necessarily live in Ohio, they were in California in different locations. Um, and we uh, presented evidence, it was a trial, the trial took six weeks total, but four weeks was just presenting evidence because we had so many people to put on the witness stand, we had to get the basic evidence so that the jury could hear everybody's case and, and determine you know, whether or not we would win. Um, it was my very first trial, and this happened a long time ago. I won. I was ecstatic. Henry won. We were ecstatic. Um, and then, and then, um, yes. So we got a jury verdict, and the jury verdict is what everybody wants. You want it in your favor. And as Henry already told you, we basically took out the names of the defendants um, just because of Williams Colonels. Um, and you can see all of our clients on the left-hand side, and you can see the amount, so like 448,000 was for one set of clients. But it went on and it went on, and we got almost three and a half million. Well, in the wonderful state of Ohio, you don't have to have a unanimous jury verdict. You just have to have three-fourths of jury verdict. So for us, we had eight jurors, and we only needed six of them in order to win. So we counted up and up the, the names on the jury verdicts, and we had one, two, three, four, five, six. So we had the magic number. So we were excited. We won. Um, and the Ohio Constitution uh, basically gives us that right. And in civil cases, you only have to have three-fourths a jury verdict. So however, uh, going into the case, we had learned that there was the two things concerning Ohio trials. One is uh, any defendant can ask for the judge to uh, allow special interrogatories to be given to the jury as part of the jury verdict, and that's a mandatory procedure. If a defendant asks for special interrogatories, the judge has to provide them to the jury. Special interrogatories, same thing as a special verdict, it allows for the parties to ask the jury what the answers are to specific questions relating to the outcome of the case. Um, 
for instance, if it's a simple negligence case, the question would be, was the defendant negligent? Uh, did it act, did the defendant act below the uh, standard of care? The next question might be, was the defendant's uh, actions uh, the cause of the plaintiff's injury? And then if the answer is to that, then yes. If the answer is yes, how much are the damages the plaintiff suffered? That would be a simple three special interrogatory verdict. Uh, we were also aware that there was a case that uh, put uh, some limitations on uh, whether or not everybody had to vote the exact same way all the way down the line in some cases in Ohio. However, as I'll read this, the facts of this case, you'll find out that it, it only applied to cases of comparative negligence, and our case was a case of civil conspiracy and fraud to defraud, and it had nothing to do with comparative negligence. And the reason why I'm going to read the facts in this case is they're short, but they also are the one. This case is sort of the seminal case that throughout the nation, a lot of the courts turn to the rationale set forth in this particular Ohio case to discuss what we're discussing today, which is also known as the same juror. So this is an Ohio Supreme Court case from 1991 named O'Connell. And in O'Connell, the plaintiff suffered broken bones and facial lacerations when her car collided with a flatbed car that had been left in the middle of a public highway at night. The plaintiff had consumed two beers and never saw the black flatbed car that was blocking the highway as was evidenced by the absence of skid marks. In rendering the verdict in Ohio, where there were eight jurors, six of the eight jurors voted for that the defendant was negligent and that the negligence proximately <coughs> caused the plaintiff's injury. So that gave rise to the basis for the plaintiff to have a verdict against the defendant. However, seven jurors found that the plaintiff was negligent and that her negligence proximately caused the injury. This is a comparative negligence state. In apportioning the fault, six jurors found that the plaintiff was 70% negligent and the defendant was 30% negligent. So in this instance, though there was an appropriate verdict for the plaintiff, the plaintiff was 70% negligent, which of course reduced the verdict against the defendant. However, two of the six jurors had previously voted that the defendant was not negligent at all and one of those two jurors previously found that the plaintiff was not negligent at all. So you had jurors <coughs> who had already found that one or the other party was not negligent at all, apportioning the fault between uh, parties and finding that the party was indeed partially at fault, even though they had previously found the party was not at fault at all. Uh, the court reasoned that it would be illogical to require or even allow a juror to initially find that a defendant had not acted causally uh, or negligently and then to subsequently permit the juror to assign some degree of fault to the same defendant. And the court in O'Connor went on to hold to, that the verdict was invalid and uh, so in that particular instance, the defendant had a verdict that was good for the defendant and the plaintiff sought reversal of the verdict uh, so it could be retried. Uh, and the court, however, held that its determination that all jurors had to act consistently down the line in favor of the plaintiff or consistently in line in favor of the defendant only was limited to comparative negligence cases. Now, there is something to keep in mind if you are operating or going to operate in a state where a unanimous verdict is not required, and that is you have to figure out what the basis of there not having to be a unanimous verdict is, and also what rules or statutes allow a less than unanimous verdict. Uh, we're not going to go deeply into that, but on the whole, you need to look at the constitution of the state where you're trying your case to find out whether it allows less than a unanimous verdict. And then you need to look at statutes to see whether 
if the state says how you're supposed to determine whether a verdict is good or bad based on statute, and then you need to look at court rules to see if they provide some basis for whether a less than unanimous verdict is good or bad. And then you need to look at case law construing those statutes and the case uh, rule and the civil rules to see whether the uh, law is uh, how it's going to be play, how it's going to play out. So you have a lot of different place you have to look to figure out how this less than unanimous verdict is going to play. Out. I also recommend you determine whether the state actually followed its own constitution in enacting the laws that allow a less than unanimous verdict. Turns out in Ohio, although it was not good for us to bring this up, it was my belief that all you had was the Constitution and you had a Supreme Court rule that allowed a less than unanimous verdict. But as far as I could tell, the Supreme Court rule was never uh, voted on as a law in Ohio, but the Ohio statute uh, Constitution said that laws must be passed to authorize the rendering of a verdict by by the concurrence of not less than three-fourths uh, of the jury. And so, in my view, I never saw that a law was passed that would allow less than a three-quarter, uh, less than a unanimous verdict, even though the Supreme Court rule said it, it was. But that was not ultimately an issue in the case. However, once the other side uh, jumped on the opportunity of trying to do away with our good verdict against uh, all three defendants, one issued by three-fourths of the jury in a non-comparative negligence case, uh, the judge decided after we showed up on the next morning to render this jury charge, which Madeline will read, for your benefit. So as Henry said, um, we thought we won, we thought it was all done, but the judge didn't release the jury yet. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen of the jury, before we get to the next phase, there is something I need to go over with you. But the jury interrogatories are a little inconsistent with the general verdict form. <clears throat> Five of you signed everything, and one of you did not. And that's fine. Two of you signed some stuff, but not other things. I don't know what the reason for it was. If it's based on your belief about the case, then I'm not asking you to change your mind or change anything you signed. What is preferable is that these, the general verdict form and the interrogatories are reconciled. In other words, the same six people signed all the way through. And we have, we have different combinations. We have six signatures on several interrogatories, but then one of those folks found damages but didn't sign the other forms the, with the specific damages or the general verdict form. Someone signed the general verdict form as to two defendants that were that the individual didn't find had any responsibility in the interrogatories. So what I would like you to do is go back and talk about this for a little bit more. So what we've got are certified copies, and I'm gonna send these back with you along with the exhibits and the jury instructions. If this is, in fact, everything you wanted to do that you did, I just need you to come out and tell me that. If, in fact, you didn't think you needed to sign something, but that's the way you feel, then I need you to add your original signature to it. At this point, I guess, you could also take your original signature off of it. But they do need to be reconciled. So what I would like you to do is go back, talk about this some more, and when you either reach the conclusion that this is exactly what you want to do, or that you have changed it, then we will bring you back out here. But they do need to be reconciled, and preferably, if you're going to find one way or the other for either side or, for, or against any party, it preferably would have the same six signatures. If that's not possible in this case, then that's not possible. And that's just the way it goes. But if it is possible, that's kind of what we need. So in this instance, uh, a, a signature indicated a positive response to the uh, interrogatory. And we had, uh, as Natalie, as the slides now show, we had uh, six jurors positive responses on every uh, special interrogatory. Natalie, if you wanted to review that. Sure. No. So um, if you look at here, you can see the, the number of jury interrogatories. We actually had one through 21 jury interrogatories. The first one was, we the jury do find that Mr. X participated in a civil conspiracy to deprive 
the fraud the plaintiffs. We got six jurors who signed it, and these are the numbers of the jurors who signed it. Then we asked for the second interrogatory. Uh, we find that Mr. Y participated in the civil conspiracy also. We have six, and then these are the six who signed it, um, which is the same six as the first one. Then we get down to the third one, and we say, we, the jury, do find that the company participated in the civil consp conspiracy to fraud. And then we have seven, so we gain a juror. Um, <coughs> then on number four, we say, we, the jury, do find that plaintiffs suffered damages that were proximately caused by civil conspiracy to fraud plaintiffs. So we have six. But if you notice, we don't necessarily have the same six that were here. We have one, three, four, six, seven, and eight, but number five, is not here. Then on 5 through 21, these were for each plaintiff, as you guys saw in the jury verdict form, each uh, plaintiff had a uh, jury interrogatory. And um, for all of those jury interrogatories, we had six jurors who signed it, and these were the six jurors who signed those interrogatories, um, which was the same as number four, but one, two, and three were, were different in the sense that five is missing from causation, and five is missing from compensation. Um, so, and then the general verdict form, which is over here, says basically the jury finds in favor of the plaintiffs, and then we have six. Um, then it says uh, jury finds in favor of the plaintiffs against and against such and such, we have six. Um, so this is just one jury verdict form, but I just kept on um, putting it in here so you can see that we, we always had six, but number five is missing from this. So the, the thing is, the jury, the judge had given the jury instructions as was requested, and nobody objected to this instruction that, you know, before the jury went out, they said we need six signatures on every interrogatory to, to receive a response one way or the other. Uh, and it was only after an argument concerning this, uh, what we call the same juror rule arising out of the O'Connell case that the judge gave the jury instruction that Natalie read to you, uh, in which he basically said, you can go back and redo everything you've already done now that you've entered a verdict against the defendants in favor of the plaintiffs. Uh, and uh, obviously, you heard the jury instruction. He basically said, you can take your signature off. That was for people that had already decided yes or you could add your signature on if you didn't decide yes in the first instance. <coughs> uh, but, uh, and then there was one juror who never voted on anything. I think that was juror number two or something. Yes, and I just want to note that's a juror who I told Henry to strike. And he <laughs> but I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, avoid piece of delivery, man. Uh, we, uh, so, we ended up with a situation where uh, six months later, uh, after uh, there was there were motions, uh, the judge entered a written order granting a mistrial uh, in the case, uh, and so uh, that was and then initially it was a uh, and that was only as to two of the defendants. The third defendant, the verdict stood. The company. Now, it happened to be the two individuals were the only two people that worked for the company and uh, how, how the company could conspire to defraud our clients without either of its people conspiring uh, beyond me. But that resulted in thereafter, you know, an appeal. But what we're focusing on is the law, the laws you have to deal with uh, when you're talking about states that allow this uh, one rule or another. There's the same juror rule, which essentially requires a straight down the line positive answer on every element of a claim in order for the verdict to be supported by the, uh, by the interrogatories. And then there's another rule that's competing uh, that is called the any majority rule. And under the any majority rule, which is what we contended prevailed in Ohio with the exception of comparative negligence cases. All you had to have was six jurors on any given uh, question with a positive outcome or a negative outcome depending on which side of the case you're on. And that's all, that's, you're done. Six is enough. 
if somebody just didn't get around to signing it, even if they were going to vote for it, then you don't have to worry about it. But if somebody, uh, if you only get five, then you don't have enough to get a positive response to that particular question. So, uh, so for purposes of, of this uh, presentation and what you need to know in order to advise your clients, or if you're ever in these jurisdictions, the, the um, states that apply the same juror rule are the following, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Ohio is supposed to be comparative negligence negligence only, which is what Henry talked about when he talked about the O'Connell case, uh, which basically says that in any other uh, type of case, you can um, basically apply to any majority rule, where, which was our case, because it wasn't a comparative negligence case, it was a conspiracy to defraud case. Um, but the judge did not seem to apply the O'Connell standard. Um, in Oregon, Oregon is, is unique. They actually apply both. Um, and I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. Well, we'll go into that in a bit. But basically, they say it's in any majority rule unless we think it's not, <laughs> which, which is not very helpful to a litigator. Um, and then obviously, Texas um, applies the same juror rule. And then Wisconsin does. And it's actually mandated by statute in uh, Wisconsin. And if you guys look at the article that I think Henry passed out, you can actually see the Wisconsin um, statute where it specifically says um, that a verdict agreed to by five six of the jury of the jurors shall be the verdict of the jury, um, and it actually kind of gives you a standard and a basis for that. But Wisconsin was the only one where it was mandated by statute. Uh, so then, the, these are the states that apply, that apply the any majority rule. So obviously, if you are a um, plaintiff, you're going to love these states. Um, if you're a defendant, you might not love them as much as the same juror rule states. Um, and you know, you guys can look at them, so I'm not going to read it to you. Um, but this is good information to know. And we have an appendix in that article that Henry passed out where it literally gives you the information you need to know on each jurisdiction. The, um, you know, the case law or the, um, or the statute that applies so that if you ever have to deal with this issue, you already kind of have um, information you can go to or go-to tool uh, to use. And for those of you who don't practice law, you would probably be indispensable if you're working with people who do practice law and they're in any of these jurisdictions and you tell them, hey, you know about the same juror rule and the any majority rule. They probably will love you for life. Okay. Um, for, for those out there in the world who may be watching this video, we do remind you of a number of things. One, we are not providing specific legal advice here, Taylor English Duma. Secondly, these rules change like crazy. Uh, if you were, if you all were to have read the paper that I presented, uh, you'll see that the courts can be very wishy-washy within any within any given state as to what they believe uh, the law is with respect to any particular case. They're supposed to, of course, if there's a statute, they're supposed to stick by the rule. But if it's a court-made decision, uh, throughout decades, if you start, there may be a clear uh, announcement that it's this rule. And then <laughs> you read on down 20 years later, and they say, uh, basically, we were mistaken. It should be, dis it should be different from that. Uh, or we need to have this exception because we can't quite uh, correlate in our minds, and this is what I'm about to go into, how the jury could have come out with this particular verdict. So therefore, we're going to strike the verdict, even though six people have entered the verdict that were properly seated jurors. So uh, like, how do, uh, what's the rationale by which uh, a court comes up with something other than the uh, any majority rule and what are the rationales for uh, sticking with uh, the any majority rule and I sort of laid this out as pure rationality versus pure practicality. Now let's throw it out there. Are, is a verdict more likely to stick under the any majority rule if you have special interrogatories issued or under the same juror rule if you have special interrogatories issued? <clears throat> any majority? Any majority. Okay, I've heard any majority. Anybody disagree? Now, why is that? Because if you have the jurors ask, answering a whole bunch of questions, 
there's the possibility that some juror is not going to sign on on a piece of paper they were supposed to. As it's, remember, we had 32 verdict forms, so we had, they had paper flying all over that uh, jury room. And uh, the ones that were specific to the uh, individual plaintiffs, they got all those just fine. It was one of the interim ones that there was, according to the judge, sort of a missing signature. Uh, yes? Can I ask a, a quick question? And I know every state is probably different, but was there a reason why you had both special interrogatories and a general jury verdict form? In my experience, <coughs> that's an either or. If a party wants special interrogatories, you go with special interrogatories from which the judge can determine what the result is, because it almost seems like having both is what creates this opportunity for confusion. Yes, and I don't know if Ohio required that. Yeah, Ohio specifically requires a general verdict, and then the verdict has to be supported in comparative negligence cases by the special interrogatories. Or if you had a special interrogatory, if you had a verdict that was signed by six jurors and only five that answered the special interrogatories to support the verdict, then that would obviously be a disconnect because you wouldn't have six jurors answering the uh, appropriate questions positively. Yes, but we didn't want the jury interrogatories. The defendants pushed for it, and and the court made us use the jury interrupt yeah and in, in ohio you actually have the right there's a statute that says if somebody asks for them you get them whereas in a lot of states it would be discretionary right did, did, did you guys look at the issue though of whether like in my experience if one side wants the special interrogatories the judge said will say okay you can have special interrogatories but you don't have both that and a general verdict form it, yeah like i said in ohio, in ohio ohio allows both. that wow in Ohio, it's both. You have to have a verdict, a general verdict, and you have, and, and they have the right to have special interrogatories. So there, there are a number of cases in Ohio that, that do uh, address special interrogatories <coughs> and general verdicts. There, are, for instance, there was one where uh, I think a hospital was sued. The claim was the doctor was negligent. Uh, the special interrogatories found the doctor was negligent, but one of the people that found the doctor was negligent hadn't signed on to the damages form. But the judge, the jury verdict was upheld anyway because they did have six on damages, and so they held that the same jury rule did not apply in Ohio <laughs> under that circumstance. So, if we look at the pure practicality of the, uh, and these are basically quotations directly out of cases from around the nation relating to the any majority rule. And if you were to you know, have, a, have a copy of our paper, you can see where those, some of those quotations are in the cases that are definitely cited. All right, so the question is, uh, uh, on, under pure rationality, a vote against fixing liability against a party is inconsistent with a subsequent vote apportioning liability. That would be the same juror rule statement. But under the any majority rule, it would be, we see no reason why dissenting jurors cannot accept the majority's finding of such negligence and participate in apportioning liability in accordance with that premise. Uh, the courts go on to say, for the majority, to hold otherwise would be to prohibit jurors who dissent on the question of a party's liability from participation in the important remaining issue of allocating responsibility among the parties, a result that would deny all parties the right to a jury of 12 persons deliberating on all issues. So this is another different state that has 12 jurors but the premise of the court is, hey, if you tell the jurors that if you ever vote on one issue against the party, you can't do anything else in that jury room again, uh, which would eliminate the participation of the full jury on all the remaining topics. Uh, and that is a concern of the any majority rule states. They go on to say, a contrary rule would result in the same t in, in time-consuming writs, mistrials, frustrating delays, and confusion for the trial judge and jury, all adding heavy burdens to the courts. I can attest that I believe that's true. <laughs> uh, okay. So 
Then you look at the rationale on the same juror rule side that says the question in all these situations is whether the jurors are capable of engaging in such deliberations consciously, fairly, and openly. But in any majority rule state, they would say, although it may be difficult for jurors who did not find a party at fault to then conscientiously and fairly apportion a percentage of fault, we see this mental task as no greater than or different from that expected of jurors in many other settings. We presume that each juror will be conscientious and fair in deliberating on apportionment of fault, whether or not he or she agreed with the prior verdict or liability or not. So in this instance, you're getting debt. There would be one juror that's already voted that I don't think this person is liable, giving deference to the other jurors who have determined that the person is liable, and then determining what amount of fault should be attributed to uh, the, the party that's liable and what amount of fault should be attributed to the plaintiff uh, as between the plaintiff and the defendant. It's, it's, a, it's a, a giving credence to the other jurors' determinations. The courts go on to say all jurors who partake in the disposition of a case under the same juror rule, the casting of a dissenting vote or any question reduces the dissenter's influence to a state of practical impotence and creates a mandate for continued unanimity among the other jurors on the remaining questions if the verdict is to survive. The dissenter is bereft of real voting power for his vote on remaining questions can no longer affect the verdict. So uh, the judges are concerned about a juror just basically being put in the corner with a with a gag on his uh, mouth after one vote against uh, the verdict, what ultimately is decided to be the verdict. Uh, so, same question on the rationality side. The, in, the any majority rule states go on to say perhaps the most common reason cited by courts adhering to, to the any majority rule is judicial economy. A requirement that individual jurors vote consistently would sharply minimize the benefit of special verdicts by increasing the number of mistrials and retrials. Uh, same juror state, however, would say we find the more rational and analytically sound is the same juror. Uh, so basically you've got competing interests. You have Judicial economy versus pure rationality. Now, uh, as we found in this case, where the defendants first of all thought they had no outlet, they came in the next morning and found a judge who was happy to listen, apparently, to their rationales for why, even though it was not a comparative negligence case, the, uh, the same juror rule ought to apply. And this is the list of the reasons, and this is where I think you really need to focus your analysis, is how do we get past this if we're trying to support an any majority verdict uh, under circumstances that somebody thinks is questionable. Uh, so in O'Connell, they list out all these reasons why they have to go with the same juror rule in comparative negligence cases where you've got this situation where you've got jurors who have not voted for negligence of a party finding there's negligence by apportioning the fault. So we got, it is illogical to require even or even allow a juror initially to find a defendant had not acted causally negligently and then subsequently permit the juror to assign some degree of fault to the same defendant. Likewise, a juror finds that the plaintiff has not acted causally negligent in a manner. It is incomprehensible then to suggest that the juror may apportion some fault to the plaintiff and thereby diminish or destroy the injured party's recovery. Uh, his perception of legal compulsion upon him to affix some responsibility upon a party who he concludes is not responsible at all it's more likely to cause the juror to assign such party an arbitrary portion of the total liabilities. And I think that's where the Supreme Court of Ohio came down in the O'Connell case. Once you get a juror to the point 
where it appears they're doing something completely arbitrarily, uh, then <coughs> their arbitrary act should not support a final verdict in the case. Uh, and uh, so, however, in, a, in my view, in a case where you have a required unanimous verdict, let's say you have a juror who says, I don't want to give the plaintiff anything, and the other side, all the other jurors are saying, I want to, we want to give a million dollars. Uh, and then ultimately, after much wrangling, a unanimous verdict is entered for $200,000. Isn't that juror who says the defendant isn't liable at all effectively making an arbitrary decision that I'll go with 200,000 even though I won't go with a million uh, just because I want to get out of here, basically. I want to conclude the case. And so therefore a good verdict is entered. It's, it's, uh, it's going to be, there are circumstances in unanimous verdict cases where there's going to be an arbitrary outcome likely by some juror anyway, unless the case is so overwhelming in favor of one party that everybody agrees on everything to the full extent. Uh, so the Ohio court went on to say, it is pure speculation and conjecture that the number of mistrials and hung juries would increase to a point where the same juror rule would substantially retard an already congested system. To me, in that instance, they're literally just putting their blinders on to what practically can happen when you've got eight people in a room that aren't legally trained trying to come up with answers. The, to, from, for the Supreme Court, just to conclude there's no statistics on this, that would seem to be not a good reason for applying the same juror rule because since they're just coming up with the same juror rule, how in the world would they have statistics in Ohio, at least, over whether it would work or not? And then it goes on to say, we, have, we view the assertion that it may produce such a phenomenon is to do nothing more than substituting efficiency <laughs> over substantial, substantive justice. So, uh, in that instance, they found the same juror will apply. So what can a trial lawyer do if they're in a state where uh, one of these issues relating to whether the special uh, interrogatories, AKA special verdict, might end up uh, being in discord with the general firm. What can they do to prepare in advance to know what happened? So what would be the number one thing you would do if you regularly came to litigation fundamentals with Henry Clay before you went to trial in another state? Read the rule. Read the rule. <laughs> <laughs> and in this instance, that would include reading the Constitution, reading the civil practice rules, reading the statutes, anything to do with how a jury verdict is formed in that state. Uh, and then try to read between the lines of all the case law, because in many states, everything that we're talking about is actually formed solely by the Constitution allowing some sort of less than unanimous verdict in case law. So if you got to the trial and a verdict comes out that's just not everybody voting for you all the way down the line uh, what can you do if you are getting the verdict back and it's two o'clock on friday afternoon first of all if you have 36 jury forms and there's only one original uh, you've got to somehow get copies of it, and that's actually what we did. We used our phones. It was later in the evening when the verdict came back initially, and we took photographs of every verdict form so we would have something to analyze that night. And frankly, it wasn't until we got out of the room uh, that we realized that I think it was juror number five hadn't signed uh, some of the verdict forms. Uh, so you'd have to go through and do this. Now, what if, uh, what if the judge wants to enter a final verdict immediately and you think that you've seen something squirrely in the verdict? You do object, then you ask the court to give you time. I I've had this happen before in cases with lengthy special interrogatories. Ask the court to take a break and call recess to give the parties time 
to make sure that the forms were filled out correctly, not suggesting there's anything wrong, but you know, judge, I need a minute to look at this and make sure everything is copacetic before the jurors go away. That's right. One of the hardest things for a trial lawyer to do is to try to put a break, the brakes on the fast moving conclusion of the trial because, and there's in fact discussed in my paper situation where the lawyer just couldn't quite articulate what it was that he knew was wrong. And then the question came up, did you waive, did you waive any objection to the verdict by not immediately raising it? Well, you know, uh, these things come hard and fast and, uh, and, and the judge is likely to want to, especially in state court where they're elected, to tell the jury, thank you so much for your service. Please vote for me next time. Bye. Go have a great weekend. And you got to somehow put the brakes on that type of circumstance. Now, you can also go in prepared. If you know you're going to have special verdicts, especially if it's for a lot of different parties, you can go in with a spreadsheet already prepared where you can go in and put check boxes uh, down the line and just see whether there's any inconsistency by being able to do a quick run through uh, looking at a matrix, trying to figure out what could happen. Uh, so who would guess whether if you allow the jury to be discharged and you thereafter find there's a problem, what's going to happen on appeal? Yeah, for the most, uh, to a great degree, it's tough luck unless you can come up with some really good rationales as to why you didn't object and make your stand right there holistically with perfect uh, discussion of all the case law that might be appropriate because the, the appellate courts tend to want to support verdicts. And so uh, they will look for any reason why a, tri a trial lawyer has messed up during the trial, even though things were moving so fast and furious, no normal human being would actually even notice the problem. Uh, it's always looked at a, as if it's a perfect setting for everybody to make rational uh, decisions based on full information. So the general premise of this is look at the states that apply each of the two rules. We do try cases all over the place work with local counsel, which by the way, I think in our case, neither counsel. I don't think the other side knew about the same juror rule and I'm pretty sure our local counsel didn't either. We were lucky to figure it out before it went into trial because of, uh, we started researching cases on special interrogatories and, and learned that that's uh, something that we might uh, be faced with. But we concluded that we did, that it wasn't applicable because the Supreme Court had expressly said it wasn't. <laughs> a comparative negligence case. Uh, and so therefore we asked for a jury, uh, we thought it was beneficial for the for us to ask that for the judge to charge that if six jurors came out in favor of the plaintiff, then that was the end of the, that was the end of the que uh, question. Yeah, and I think that something that Henry said that needs to be emphasized is that if you are litigating in these states that are same juror rule states, you really need to talk to us because we'll give you a brief already prepared with the outline of bam, 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 what you need to say if this occurs. We will hope that it doesn't happen to you, but if it does, being prepared is, is half the battle. So you really need to already have briefed the issue before because anybody who's been in trial knows trial moves quickly and you're not gonna have time to sit there and brief it, although we were spending all night long trying to figure out the specific issue.